powerful, right? Yeah? Yeah. I like when the actor says, somebody has got to change. It's up to you to be an example for people who don't know any better. I'm sure everybody in here connected to those stories in some way, right? How many of you know somebody that's been shot? That's pretty much everybody in this room. How many of you know somebody that's been killed? That's sad. How many of you know somebody that's in jail or have family members in jail? That's crazy. How many of you know that I ain't got nothing to nothing to do with how far you can go? That's it. That's it. If you don't know, now you know. That ain't got nothing but nothing to do with how far you can go. There's so much that we have to say about everything that we just witnessed. So let's get the conversation started. Joining us to talk about the book, the issue, and ways to move forward, we have Latoya Winters. She is a Northern Illinois student and a violence survivor. We also have Deshaun McKnight, a violence survivor who speaks honestly about his experiences with gangs and violence. That's right, you just heard their stories up here. Also have Dr. Gerard McClendon, a Chicago journalist and professor at Chicago State University. And we also have violent survivor Jessica Disu, also known as FM Supreme. She's a rap artist and a peace activist as well. Also coming to the stage, we have Che Rhymefest Smith. He's a Grammy award-winning rap activist and commentator on WVON's radio Speak Out. And close and personal friend of Kanye West in common. Not to be name dropping. Yeah, send them your mixtapes after the show. No, don't. <laughs> uh, we are so pleased to have all of you guys joining us today. So I'm going to join you here on the panel. And we are going to talk about the stories we just heard. So first I want to address to Latoya. The book puts a human face on the statistics. So let's begin our discussion talking about what came to mind as you watch your story being portrayed here on the stage. Um, I've seen it a couple of times, but it's, it always gets harder every time I watch it. And I just always realize that it's me that they're talking about, and it just kind of takes me to another place. And I know that I've physically been there in every one of these situations, but I just always sit and think about, like, how have I overcome some of those things or how I've continued to pursue and move forward. Um, it's not that easy, but I still find a way to keep moving. And I'm always just trying to motivate other children who are in similar situations, but younger than myself, than I am today. Um, it's really hard to watch, but I know that I've already been through a lot of those things. So I know that I'm more so okay now, but I'm not over a lot of those things. So it's good that you're using that pain and using all of those things that you are feeling to give back and to possibly impact so many other lives. Women, it can always be a much different story and sometimes we have a slightly different experience in communities under siege. How do you feel uh, it's different from what men experience in those types of communities? Um, I think us women, we have a different like emotional spiel to things because men hold this like whole masculine thing that they have to uphold. And as a woman, I think we're easily broken down, but we also get that extra strength to build ourselves back up. And that's something that keeps me going, um, being a young woman and having a lot of women in my support system that I can go to. That really helps also. I'm from a family full of women. I work with a lot of women. I was born and raised. And um, brought up by a lot of powerful women. And so looking at those faces and then helping to raise a lot of my nieces and my younger sisters, that gives me motivation to keep going and to keep fighting as a woman. Wow, it's great that you have that strength within you to keep pushing forward. 
Did you ever think that you would escape to live the life that you have right now? I never thought that I'd escape, honestly. Um, living in my neighborhood, you just don't think that you'll get out and make a way. Um, the first opportunity I had after graduating eighth grade to go off to the residential scholarship program, Boys Hope, Girls Hope, was my first known that I'll be able to make something of myself and I'll be able to go to a better high school compared to those high schools in my neighborhoods that don't really have the great resources that I wanted and needed to even think about going off to college. So going off to all girls Catholic high school, Regina Dominican, it gave me insight towards the future and I knew that I'd be able to do anything. And then that's what gave me more hope to go off to college and to pursue my bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. You surprised yourself. Congratulations. Was there ever a defining event that made you feel like you could make it out? Was it getting accepted to that program, getting out of the community, going to that school? Um, I have a group of women from the Mayor Lake House Social Service Agency on the west side of Chicago who've always been my support system and they've helped me to accomplish a lot. And having this support system behind me has really helped me to know that I can do more and I will do more. So after going off to Boys Hope, Girls Hope, and then going off to college, I knew that I can still do a lot more things and I'm continuing to work towards those things today. All right. Well, congratulations. If you could pick one thing that could change the lives of those in your community and have it done, have action, what would that be? It's always hard to just pick one thing because I think multiple things um, play into making a lot of big things happen. So all those little pieces honestly build up to make a bigger thing happen. Um, I know that a lot of the things that I've been doing as far as like reaching out to high schools and grade school children and talking to the youth about the violence that's impacted me has helped others to talk about their violence or you know start to write poetry or confide in someone who they can um, have to support them. But to say that one thing, I know that I can't say one thing will make that happen. Um, doing certain things like giving back to my neighborhood or taking kids to college trips or just having groups of people where I work at the Mayor Lake House Social Service Agency to come out to different neighborhoods so that we can all try to do things in neighborhoods and then pass it on to bigger neighborhoods and even the city of Chicago or the state of Illinois. It's going to take multiple things to make those things happen. So the little things that I do are always going to you know, take those necessary steps to make the bigger things happen. Mm -hmm. So one thing, no, I can't say, but multiple things. Mm -hmm. every, everything that I do every day, it'll make a difference and it'll help to build that bridge that'll help us to accomplish the things that we're trying to accomplish. And so you feel more people who made yeah. it out. More, more people back. becoming inv involved because mm -hmm. though we say one person can't make a difference, that one person can make a difference because they'll reach out to a smaller group, then that small group reaches out to an even bigger group. And if we keep reaching out and helping build each other up, we'll be able to make all these things happen. We think that we may not be able to stop the violence, but honestly, we will be able to stop the violence. It's just us reaching out and us helping to build and educate each other about it. Mm -hmm. Showing a different way. All right, Deshaun, let's talk to you. As a child, how did growing up in a family involved in gangs, how did that affect you? Well, I was limited to the places where I can go. Like, I couldn't go to a certain store. I couldn't go to a certain park. I can't even go to a certain school because the rival gang was in that area. And it hurt because I couldn't play with some of my friends just because I couldn't go to their house or they couldn't go to my house. The only way we could meet up is we sneak and meet up or at a, at the school event, or we had the park at a park where we can play at playing ball, and sometimes we had to do that in secret, see, because we don't want the other person's family to know that we're with that person, and because we're thinking they might try to harm them. So it was really difficult growing up. So did you ever believe that there was a way that you could be different? Yeah, I, I believed that because I didn't want that life. I seen many people living that the gang life, and then didn't get them far out of dead or in jail. And I didn't want that, I wanted to live my life. So I always try to stay positive and try to be different than everyone. I'd rather stay in the house than go out and hang out with everyone. Just for the simple fact that I'm afraid that I might get caught in a crossfire of someone else's gang activity or some gang activity from my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, other gang might see me just because my family a gang, they assume that I'm in a gang just by affiliation with my family. So just to be different, I stayed in the house, I stayed to myself, and I stayed with other people that did positive things like Latoya here. 
Me and her come from the same area, like social center. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met Latoya. And if it weren't for a place like that, I wouldn't be here now. So you're now on a different path, as you, as you just said. How do you feel like you got there? Was it that center yes. that saved your life, really? Yes, that center was a major part and what saved my life. Like, because if I wasn't there, I would be caught up in the gang activity that was going on at my house. Like, the activity, I mean, the, uh, the center are closed at 6 o'clock, and I'll sneak and hide in the women's bathroom and stand on the stall until everyone's gone just to stay there so I can have a safe place to be. Mm -hmm. Like, if I couldn't go home, where else can I go? So I'll stay there. I'll stay there until the, janitorial, the janitors leave, and I'll leave out with them, catch the bus home, mm -hmm. and hope that I don't get caught in anything. I had to call my mom, like, Mom, can you come and pick me up from the bus stop? Mom, can you meet me somewhere? Mom, can you have someone? Like, not someone that was in a gang I had to pick. Like, I didn't want to call my mom. Mm -hmm. That's just by the simple fact that something might happen to her, but that's the only person I can call that wasn't really in a gang that I felt that could protect me. Mm -hmm. Well, you're making some smart choices. We know that you are a father now. Yes. Congratulations on Thank that. You. How does... <laughs> How does that play into the choices that you make day to day? It plays a big role in because my father, he, my father, he's not around. I was raised by my little brother's dad and I consider that as my real father and he's dead. So if you think about it, I have two fathers, a, real, a biological father that wasn't around and a stepfather that life was shortened by gang violence and I wasn't there to enjoy, enjoy him really. He wasn't there to see none of my accomplishments in life. And I don't want to miss out on anything that my little girls do just because I'm out here being stupid and being out here in the streets or affiliated with someone in the streets. So by me changing that, I'm changing their lives too. I'm getting them a chance to have that father in their life. A lot of chance that I don't have, I didn't have, a lot of people in this audience might don't have. Mm -hmm. Like having a father in your life is a big role. That's who shows you how to be a man. That's who shows you love. And if it wasn't for my little girls, I, I wouldn't know what to do. So what advice would you have for the young men in this audience who are dealing with the same kinds of challenges that you had when you were coming up? I mean, you don't have to be a part of that. I mean, it's always there. It's always someone there. Look at them. You. Look at them. Tell it's, them. It's, it's always there. It's always someone there to help you, either a teacher, a parent, or someone, a friend. Even that old guy that's always talking to you all up in your ear talking about gang violence. We all know that one person that every time we go around them, they tell them you need to straighten up, you need to wear your pants like this, you need to do doing that. Listen to them, they're giving you knowledge. That's a person there that you could come to for help. That's a person that been there and done that and letting you know that's not the right path to do. I mean, we all got our choices in life and if that's the lifestyle you want to choose, I don't advise you to choose that lifestyle. There's much better things out here than just standing on the streets. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. McClendon, you are a journalist, a professor, a motivational speaker. What do you believe the answer is? I think the answer is within. You know, uh, I think everybody in this audience, all these beautiful people in this audience have talents and gifts. You just have to line up your talents and gifts with what's good, and you have to step up your friendship game. So a lot of times people hang out with people who aren't good for them. And I always have this model with my brothers. I'm like, if you're the smartest person in your group, you need to find another group. Hmm. You need to find people. <laughs> you, you need to find people as good as you and people better than you so you can come up and step up your friendship game. You don't play tennis or basketball with people weaker than you. You play with be people better than you so you can get what? Yeah. Better. Step up your friendship game. And I think if we start stepping up our friendship game and we start holding our friends and ourselves accountable, the whole community will change and there will be a ripple effect. Wow, I love that. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is an issue that disproportionately affects black and Latino communities. Why do you believe that is and, and what do you think we can do about it? I think a lot of it has to do with expectations. You know, uh, 
we settle for the worst. Some communities settle for the best. We settle for a job. Other communities settle for a career. Yeah. We settle for some, some bogus boy or girl when we should be looking for somebody better who's a man or a woman. Yeah. We settle. We settle. So. Church. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, so as you step up your education game, your friendship game, uh, step up who you date, you know, there's some people you shouldn't even want to be seen with. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> so, 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 I, you know, I, I'm not gonna front. I mean, I take a lot of selfies, but I'm careful who I take my selfies with because that selfie is gonna go everywhere. Oh, man. <laughs> we need to have an after the show. We yes. need to just sit down and talk. <laughs> uh, so we talked about the racial disparities, but let's talk about location because it's not just uh, an issue that affects youth in urban areas, also suburban areas as well. In fact, one day in a suburb very close to here, something really profound impact you. What was that? Yeah, uh, when I was working at WGN CLTV doing my show, Gerard McClendon Live, I received a phone call five years ago from my wife. And she said, you need to drop the phone and leave the studio immediately. I'm in the middle of the newsroom at Channel 9. I'm like, why? She said, you need to come home right now. And so I gave my producer my, the telephone, and the producer talked to my wife. And he said, make sure Gerard gets home immediately. So my producer walked me out to the parking lot, and he said, those two people, that elderly couple who was found, shot in the forest preserves, they were your parents, Gerard. Mm. And so, it was my parents' 54th wedding anniversary on that Friday, and they were, they were abducted. It was a home invasion, and I've said this before on TV and the radio, I have no love for gangster disciples because two African-American teenagers, I have no love for GD. I'm gonna say that right now. Two African-American, a 17-year-old, Y'all feel me? So let me make it plain. Let me make it plain. A, sep a 17 year old black male, 18 year old black male, one of them should have been in college at Purdue University, decided to stay home. They got tattoos one week before they killed my parents. ABK, anybody killer. So who did they decide to run up on and try to hit a lick? My parents, because I'm on TV. They hit my parents' home, Hammond, Indiana. They got in my parents' home. They got $70 and some jewelry. Took my parents' Cadillac, went on a joyride, ran out of gas on the Dan Ryan. They got arrested by the police. Mm. What hurt me probably worse than my parents being killed by two gangster disciples was that these were two black men who could have been doing something else. Right. Doing dumb stuff. Doing dumb stuff. Come on, for $70 and some jewelry, work a job, cut somebody's grass, shine some shoes, yeah. do something. You know, it's a shame because we, protest and we get up in arms about what, you know, a police officer of a different race may do to us. You know, we get upset. We always look outside. But nine times out of ten, we are hurting ourselves. Yes. We are doing it to each other. And nobody is rioting. Nobody is marching as much. You know, we need to protect each other. Right. And we, we need to care about yes. each other. Not just somebody that we might be blood related to. We are all related. We are all in this together. So as we wrap up a little bit, your advice to the people listening to you right now. My advice is 
what Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle said. They said that you should, everybody in here was created for a purpose. Can I get everybody to agree to that? Everybody in here was created for a purpose. Okay, so let me take it, let me take it to the next level. The purpose that the creator created you for was a good and high purpose. It's your job to not do nefarious negative activities because God saw it fit to have you born. You special. And so it's their responsibility as well as ours to do something good. Everything's created for a purpose and you need to look for your highest purpose. That's what you need to look for. And as I always say, I'm going to close by saying this. My job on this earth is to spread in difficult information in a very simple way. The other job that I have on this earth is to save the nerd. Everybody in here has an inner nerd. Everybody in here has something they really, really care about, but you don't tell other people what you care about. You need to work on what's good, the highest good, and start nurturing your inner nerd. Yes. FM Supreme. Yes. <laughs> the lyricist. <laughs> Let's talk to you before we have the pleasure of hearing about your sounds. Tell us about the Peace Exchange. What is that? Absolutely. So the Peace Exchange is a young adult leadership program that I co-founded and helped develop last year. We partnered with um, six different community organizations and took uh, six young leaders from the south and west sides of Chicago to Southeast Asia where we practice studying peace um, in 3D in real life with uh, Buddhist monks mm -hmm. in Thailand and Myanmar. Prior to taking the trip and doing a documentary with Free Spirit Media, we produced a national symposium on violence called Transforming Pain into Power. Um, Urban Prep was in the building. I'm not sure if y'all campus was, but y'all definitely represent it. Um, and the goal is really just the <clears throat> peace is within and without. It starts with you, it starts with us. And I think that it's powerful that this uh, auditorium is filled with young people. I know a lot of y'all probably thinking like, we just here because we gotta be here, woo, woo, woo. What can I really do to stop the violence? But you actually can do something by being positive in your own house and in your community and in your school. It really starts with you, you know what I'm saying? Like, what I've learned from going to Southeast Asia and going to London and going to Leeds and going around the world and working with young people is that the youth is where it's at and y'all control the culture. And the thing is, peace isn't cool, and it's, uh, violence is a part of our culture, it's embedded. You know what I'm saying? Like, they say that the statistics, young black men between the ages of 15 and 24 are predominantly either victims or the perpetrators, either shooting or killing. Why is that? And then we go back into our history, you go back to slavery, you go back, look at what's happened in Ferguson, it's like our community, we do riot when it happens with a murder outside of our community. But when it happens inside of our community, we say nothing. And the reason why that is has a lot to do is because we become numb to it. So I'm working with Tom Burrell, who wrote this book called Brainwash, and it talks about how we've been brainwashed and marketed and sold this black inferiority complex. This complex that makes you feel like I'm inferior. I can't go to college. I can't do nothing. I can't. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. And so I'm here just to keep reminding y'all of that. You talked about the culture. Obviously, rap music is a huge part of the culture. Rap music is the culture. How do you, what role do you feel the rap music plays in the problem and the solution? I mean, rap is, rap, hip hop is the voice of young America, is the voice of our generation, the millennial generation, the generation before us. I think that, I won't say that rap drives the violence, but I can't help but think that when some people are going out ready to go hit, that they're not listening to drill music. Not blaming drill music, but I think that as much negative music as we have out there, we need a balance with positive. Everybody ain't on that. Some people do want to grow up. Some people do want to go to college and be somebody other than a rapper. And I'm a rapper and I'm saying that like, and I've been blessed on my path to become more than just a rapper, to become a public speaker, an entrepreneur through my activism and mentoring young people and becoming an educator without trying to be and just back continuously reading. So I think that, um, Music is important, but if you're going to make music, if you ain't rap about nothing, don't rap. Everybody rap. My grandma can rap. You feel me? <laughs> Real talk. <laughs> okay, so talk to the young people. Your advice. My advice, honestly, just believe in yourself. Hmm. And that's your motto at uh, Urban Prep. We believe. You know what I'm saying? Like, you believe in yourself, you feel? And, and, and it starts with that. You don't, and then once you believe in you, other people will believe in you. 
You don't have to be like, oh, nobody believed me, so I can't do it. You got to do it. Michael Jordan did not make the basketball team in high school. But this man turned out, went to um, North Carolina, and then he became Michael Jordan. He, if he didn't believe, like his coach in high school didn't believe, then he wouldn't have made it. Hmm. Y'all wouldn't be wearing Jordans right now. You <laughs> feel me? <laughs> All right, yes. thanks so much. Let's yes. talk to Rhyme Fest. You call yourself a rap activist. What does that mean? Well, I don't think it's, it's enough to rap anymore. Like, this is a conversation that I have with a lot of my friends. You know, uh, Common and I just got off the phone like 15 minutes ago. Yeah, I saw you texting. Yeah, and, he, and his thing is, you know, now he's doing movies. And he's like, man, I got to do something more for Chicago. I got to do this, do this. You know, Kanye, me and Kanye, me and ASAP Rocky, me and Kendrick, we talk, and, and all of the, the artists that got lyrics and the artists that, are, they're like, man, it's not enough to just rap because things are happening, so we gotta be involved in it. So, you know, uh, we did a concert this year called the iFest, mm -hmm. where everybody Huge. came together, yeah. yeah. We, for the first time, all the Chicago rappers were together, and Jennifer Hudson, and Dave Chappelle, and Joaquin Noah, and you know, a lot of the profits went to, and even though Common paid for it, a lot of the profits went to community organizations, and we were able to get young people to be on the same stage from all over the city, to be on the same stage as the artists that they see on TV, and to interact in a way where they know, man, my dreams, are just a step away. My dreams are not just on BET or this or that. My dreams are in my community, and I can reach my dreams from where I sit and where I stand. So where do you see rap music falling into the solution? I know there are challenges with what gets radio I don't think I don't think rap music is the solution. Mm. I think education is the solution, and I think... Yeah. Uh, I, think I think the problem is... The problem is that the majority of people that listen to rap that listen to rap music and follow it don't realize that the people that got sustainable careers in rap are educated and come from education. You know what I'm saying? So, for instance, Kanye West, his mother was a Fulbright scholar and dean of English at his university. His mother, Kanye, lived in China from five, and we know about all the styles, but did you know he lived in China from five to eight and learned Mandarin? Did you know that Kanye had a full scholarship to go to the Art Institute, not for music, but for visual arts? You know what I'm saying? And so the, 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 when we wrote the album College Dropout, it was based on him being like, man, I grew up with a doctor, I'm educated, I wanna do music based off what I've been learning from my mother, Dr. Donda West. Lupe Fiasco, his parents were, his father was an expert martial artist, uh, um, and, and his mother was a, a community political activist. Chance the Rapper, his father worked for, Barack, worked for Barack Obama and now works for Rahm Emanuel. Little John, his parents are professors. Common, his mother is Dr. Hines, who on the school board, on the Chicago school board. Like all these people with sustainable careers. I mean, and we could talk about drill artists, but they here today, gone tomorrow. I'm talking about sustainable careers in music come from education. Yeah. Rap itself in the camp. <laughs> education. You talked about Kanye West and his mother, Donda. Uh, she has a foundation. You work closely with that foundation. They work to provide arts instructions for young people. How do you believe, uh, why do you believe that that is important, arts instruction? In the community. When you look at, it all goes back to education, right? And, and I just want to say this before I say that. Yeah. People say, man, the youth are the answer. The youth got the answer. I don't, I don't really believe all elders or all youth got the answer. Let's go back to education. Malcolm X was 22 years old when he decided, man, I'm going to read a dictionary and memorize it, get out of jail and be something different than Detroit Red. Fred Hampton was 20 years old when he decided, man, I'm going to start reading the philosophies of Mao Zedong and I'm going to learn this and learn that. Now I'm going to be a Black Panther. Dr. King started in his 20s and died at 33, which is also the same age as that, that Jesus died. But what I would say is this, like all of these young people from history that changed the way, it wasn't just because they was young. Mm -hmm. It's because they was young and educated. It's because they was young and involved in a movement. You know what I'm saying? But as we get as we get to artists, man, Paul Robeson said the artists are the gateway of truth. You know what I'm saying? So it's like artists have to be vulnerable 
artists have to stop telling lies on themselves. I remember when um, I was in Kanye's mom house, because she trained me, you know what I'm saying? Kanye's mother trained me, him, all our friends, GLC, everybody. So I was, we were in her, her house, and I'm rapping about how many girls I got, how many dudes I shot, how much money I got, how many drugs I sold. And she came in and said, Ryan Fest, did you really like sell all those drugs and have <laughs> sex with all those women and kill all those people? I'm not judging you, there's no judge zone, but I'm asking you, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, nah, but you know, you gotta say that to get on the radio. Like people think that early 2000s is different from today, it ain't. It was the same, it, it's the same person that's getting us to sell each other out on the radio it was there 20 years ago. So what I'm saying is this, so she said, did you do all that? I said, no, nah, but I'm trying to get big, famous. She said, how would you like it if you got famous telling a lie on yourself? Mm. And then everybody believed that you were something that you wasn't, that you told them you was. Mm. Would you be comfortable being rich and telling a lie on yourself? And then I think about, man, when I, when I met Rick Ross, he was such a really good dude. And I'm like, man, this dude got famous telling a lie about himself. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, because if you go look and listen to the real Rick Ross, he took his whole everything, and Rick Ross is a correctional officer, so he know where selling drugs gonna get you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But he telling you to sell drugs. And, and, and so, and so mm. I said, I wouldn't feel very comfortable with that, you know? And then that's when me and Kanye made this rhyme, and in the rhyme, it was a line written, we all self-conscious, I'm just the first to admit it. Mm. Mm. When we gonna start telling the truth about ourselves? That's what's gonna free us, and I think that when you look at school, they took away all the arts programs. You know what I'm saying? There's no place for young people to go to really express themselves. So they like, man, if I can make money doing it right here and there's nowhere else for me, to, I'm going this way. You know what I'm saying? And, and what we do at Donda's house is we give you a place and we also give you an opportunity to, to excel in a career of arts development. Well, talk to the young people right here. What would your advice be? My advice? Man, to all people, I, I don't, I don't believe. I, I gotta say it again. Not just young yeah. people. I don't believe in talk to talking everyone. To young people or, your advice, because it's a lot of old, ignorant people too. That needs to <laughs> well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, 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 I, I would say to everybody: be fragile, tell the truth on yourself, be honest about who you are, and ignorance to learn to stay away from you. Also, teach people how to treat you. Mm. Well, some of our students have tweeted some of uh, some questions, some concerns, and some thoughts about violence. So let's get into some of those questions. And anyone, feel free. Um, before we get to that, we also want to say one thing that has become abundantly clear without hope, resources, and a belief in future possibilities. Many young people are absorbed by the streets. And so one way to stop the violence is to never let it start. Giving opportunities to children through education is one of the best violence prevention methods. So let's lift each other up. Why don't all of you give yourselves a round of applause just for being here and for being part of the conversation. And for the wonderful thing that I know you will accomplish. Why don't we give our wonderful panel a round of applause. We're gonna to get to those social media questions in just a minute, but we're gonna take a break and let you have a little bit of fun. So mm -hmm. we'll be back soon. All right.